Hello, and welcome to Lecture 2 in your Anthropology Web CT course. In this chapter, we'll be talking about biological universals, the evolutionary basis for human behavior that can be found throughout the human race. For anthropologists, of course, humanity is just one race. They find no scientific basis for distinguishing between groups of people. Chimpanzees share 98% of our genetic structure, but if you look between groups of humans, there's really no significant differences. Nevertheless, if you look from the perspective of cultural relativity, all cultures over time have differentiated or categorized people into racial groups. Some do it on the basis of skin color, others on the basis of national origin, religion, ethnicity, language group, body size, or a number of other variables. Nevertheless, for anthropologists, one of the more significant differences genetically can be found between males and females. Looking at an African-American male and an Anglo male and an African-American female, you find more similarities between the two males than you do between the male and the female of what in American society are considered individuals of a single race. One of the reasons that this happens is because males share an entire chromosome, the Y chromosome, that females don't have. The Y chromosome and the resultant testosterone, brain structures, and body structures produce significant differences between men and women. This is a biological universal found cross-culturally. Partly as a result of this, males in all cultures are dominant, even in cultures which are matrilineal, where inheritance is controlled by the female side of the family. It's the woman's mother, woman's brothers, father, and sons who are really in control of what she herself owns. Males and females are very different. Males in all cultures, universally, biologically, are more aggressive and more likely to kill. Who they choose to kill varies from culture to culture, as well as when they kill and how they kill. In some cultures, men kill enemies, people who have been designated by the state as being someone who's threatening them or their livelihood. This can be people from a different country, a different religion, a different ethnic group, but someone defined culturally as an enemy. In other countries, individuals are allowed to kill or justified in killing rivals. These rivals may be rivals for a woman's affection. They may be rivals or competitors in a business sense, but everyone understands when that killing occurs. In other cultures, killing is done by proxy. For example, you think of a corporate executive who condones the pollutants of pollution of waterways or landfills with carcinogens that he knows will affect people, if not now, in future generations. Also, you think of people at an upper echelon in politics sending younger men off to do their killing for them. In some cultures, killing of relatives is condoned, again, primarily by men. We talked in the last chapter about infanticide, but killing of other relatives is also part of what occurs cross-culturally. In some cultures, sisters are killed, the young girls in a family, for engaging in premarital or extramarital sexual behaviors. This brings dishonor on the family, and the family honor can only be restored if the woman is killed. She's usually killed by an uncle, a father, a brother, some male member of the family who wants to make sure that family honor is restored. Other members of the family are able to find a spouse, the family is able to do business in their community, and the family is regarded with respect. <coughs> Excuse me. In other cultures, in our culture, for example, the women more likely to be killed are wives or girlfriends. Again, although the law certainly doesn't condone it, everyone understands when a man kills his girlfriend or wife for fooling around or having an affair, or even when he only suspects it. On a more positive note, another universal human behavior is eating. Everyone enjoys that. And in addition, the sharing of food, particularly with the younger members of the family or group. If you didn't share food with those younger members of the family, there wouldn't be any long-term survival for the species. Who's considered young, of course, varies from group to group and is culturally relative. In the U.S., some individuals at the age of 25, 30, or even 35 are still living with their family and letting their parents provide the food. In other cultures, children as young as five, six, or seven are expected to contribute to the family's food supply rather than subtract from it. Who's considered family varies from culture to culture. How far you extend into grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, 
members of the same clan, members with the same last name. All that's culturally relative. What you eat is culturally relative. Whether you eat raw seals, whether you eat insects, whether you eat cow's milk, considered only a baby's food in some cultures, whether you consider pork, which is considered religious taboo in other cultures, all of those foods that you eat are relative to your culture. Finally, anthropologists are faced with three different variables to consider in looking at how people respond to the world that they live in. The first is culture, the learned traditions that function over time. Second, biology, those behaviors produced by evolution, universal in the human species. And finally, the interaction between biology and culture, where biology provides the